Good morning, class. I'm going to give you a, or at least a video that has some notes that I scribbled down last night, uh, just to, to help you prepare for uh, your midterm in your leadership class. And the, the grades were actually very good for um, the first midterm, but I mean, the first quiz. So what we're probably going to do is just 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 uh, concentrate on four, five, and six as we we move through this review. And just bear with me because uh, again, I scribbled down these notes last night. Um, and even though we're concentrating on four, five, and six, don't ever forget to the concept of that effective leadership. And you've got the leader the follower, and the context, because context, is, again, is extremely important because they even have a chapter, and maybe a chapter five, maybe, what situ situational leadership. But as you start to lead your teams, you're going to be placed in a situation that not everyone wants to be a leader. Uh, but at the same time, um, as a leader, you will tend to lean on them um, with an expectation of helping their other team members, especially if they're extremely um, good at the job or if they have the expertise and the experience that you need, they're going to be um, a very valuable resource to you as a leader. So what you want to do is you want to mentor, you want to motivate. Um, again, it goes back to you can't make individuals be leaders. You can't force them to climb that corporate leadership ladder. However, you can um, motivate and, and mentor them in such a way that they are willing to step up to the plate and help you at any point in time with other members of the team. And it, it may be just, you know, somebody's, you know, introverted and they just don't like the notoriety or the, or the um, exposure they get. But they don't mind setting and helping team members. And, and while you might not think much of it, it is a huge advantage to you as a leader to have those type of individuals. Um, there are certain processes um, in an organization where you, know, you, you want to make sure that you know, you're communicating, uh, you're working between leaders and followers, uh, you want to develop a loyalty, you want individuals to be engaged because loyalty to the leader and engaged in um, the team's activities, they're going to they're going to drive the team uh, to be extremely successful. And not only is it going to make your team look good, it's going to make you look good as a leader. And you you talk about the, the chapter, I can't remember whether it was Maybe it was the first one, and maybe it was chapter four, where they talked about you know followership and they talked about managing up and managing sideways. Um, and as a leader, it, it's up to you. With you know, as you work with your followers, get to know them well enough that you can identify um, when they're having issues. You know, maybe it's it's an issue with the personal life. Maybe somebody's sick. Maybe it's somebody you know their child's having issues at school. Maybe. Um, they're in a car accident. I mean, there's a lot of things that can imp that can impact uh, your team members or your followers, if you, if you feel more comfortable with that terminology. But you want to make sure you know them well enough that you can reach out and help them and especially realize or identify when they're having these issues. Because if they start, if you've got an, a, a very good team member, they start to tail off and, and start to fall below what you think their expectations should be, reach out to them and, and see if there's something you can do to help them over the hump, whatever that hump is. And then we got into uh, into the text and uh, they were talking about, uh, you know, effective followers and types of followers. And um, you've got, um, you've got the conformist, you've got the alienated, you've got the effective uh, the conformance is, you know, talked about in the text, you know, being brown nosers and highly agreeable, highly agreeable, uh, maybe not as, as engaged as they should be, but they're extremely loyal to the leader. You've got the alienated, which um, they are independent thinkers. 
um, critical thinkers, um, may not be as engaged as you want them to be, may not be as loyal to the leader. And then you've got the effective, you've got the effective follower that's, you know, highly engaged, highly loyal to the leader, um, independent, critical thinkers. And you, you talk about um, an effect, you know, when you're talking about an effective leader or really an effective follower too, but more importantly, probably from an effective follower's standpoint, you want to assume responsibility and accountability. You want to balance service with courage to challenge. And I think that one is extremely important. You, you've, you want to um, be a team player, but if you see something that's going to go off the rail, don't as a follower ever hesitate to challenge it. And to me, the way to challenge it, and we've talked about it in some of the, or I've talked about in some of the other videos, is to lay out the information and lay out some options and lay out some probabilities of success. And that makes it easier to present your case, especially if you're trying to manage up. Uh, and you wanna support the organization unless it gets to a point that you just can't support the organization. And at that point, your only option may be to leave the organization. And in some instances, that's an extremely um, negative um, situation for both you and the organization. But but I have seen individuals that uh, they just came down to that and they could not support the organizational goals. And for them, it was better to leave or have the courage to leave than end up as an alienated employee. If you want to manage up, you know, they, they talked about it in the textbook for the managing up piece, you have to accept feedback and direction. You have to work uh, with leader styles and goals and perspective. And you also want to have a role model for behavior as you climb that corporate ladder. But I think of all of these types of situations, I think the, the most important is, is being able to accept feedback and being able to accept direction. Because if you can do that as a follower, then that's going to give you a leg up as a leader and being able to develop uh, the feedback and the direction that you're going to have to pass on to one of your followers. I think that takes care of that one. Um, and then we get into um, to these um, types of situational leadership. And, you know, you have to, on the situational leadership, again, it goes back to the leader-follower context. But on the situational leadership, you have to think about the type of followers. You have to think about the industry, the market, uh, the organization you're working in. But probably the most important is just think about the type of followers that you as a situational leader are going to be managing. Uh, and then with situational leaders, they talked about flexible and inflexible. Inflexible, uh, it's usually in a, when the, you know, the context is static, not a lot of change. Policies and procedures are in place and you're plugging right along and um, you don't have to worry too much about it. And then, you know, on the inflexible side, there's the participative, um, the relations oriented type of leader. And then there's the task oriented, the directive type leader. And it's almost almost view that as two ends of the spectrum, both on each end. Um, my leadership style's probably been it's hybrid somewhere in the middle, probably closer to task oriented than relations oriented. But as a effective leader, I think you're probably better off if you can be that hybrid leader and be somewhere maybe in the middle of that uh, in the middle of that distribution. Doesn't mean you have to be one or the other, and you can be a task oriented. Uh, a leader and lean in that direction, but you can still build relationships. So it, I think that's where I, the, the, and then they, they talk about, um, I guess they go into the, to the flexible type of situational leaders. And, you know, we talked about the path goal. We talked about the Hersey Blanchard and we talked about the room Jago. So those are three, um, at least from an academic perspective and from the from the textbook, those are three types of flexible situational leaderships. Uh, under the path goal, 
You've got the leadership style, you've got directive, you've got supportive, you've got participative, and you've got achievement oriented. And then on the follower needs, you've got ambiguous work, you've got lack of confidence, you've got individuals want more voice, and you've got, they talk about the work more challenging. Um, I don't, I guess I view it as individuals, while they may not think the work is, is not challenging enough, they're individuals that want to move up the corporate ladder, want to take on more responsibility. So uh, ambiguous work and directive, you know, kind of tie together, correlate, supportive and lack of confidence correlate together, participative and, and more voice. Um, so you start to see that correlation there. And then the achievement oriented. And to me, it's, it's not so much the work is not challenging. It's just they want to expand their, and it goes back to your human capital. You're wanting, it's individuals wanting to expand that human capital, wanting to improve expertise and experience. It's going to help them climb that. Um, again, we talked about the inflexible. It's, it's static content. It's it, You don't have to worry about a lot of things. You've got your policies, procedures in place. Um, and if you remember the text, when they talked about these three different uh, approaches, the path goal was more day-to-day -day operations. Um, it more, just like in healthcare. So, so if you're in healthcare, if you know, you're probably using the path goal more along if you're processing healthcare claims, those are transactional that's transactional type of work. It's day-to-day -day operations. Um, maybe managing a call center, day-to-day -day operations. You, you've got certain policies and procedures in place and it's all transactions based. So that's more the path goal. If you, if you get into the decision-making process and, and talk about um, the uh, the process and how you're going to either relinquish control, maintain control, how you're going to maximize your ability as a leader over the control of your team. That's where you're getting into the other two, the Hersey Blanchard and the, and the Vroom Jago. Those are more the decision-based, uh, strategy-based um, type of approaches. So, um, and again, a lot of these, a lot of these approaches of the, the three um, depends on um, those individuals. It, to me, it depends on the timeline. It depends on the importance of the decisions that we're working on. It depends on the ability of your team to assume more responsibility and accountability. Because remember, at the end of the day, if you are a leader and you have, let's say, delegated to your team, trying to grow your team, trying to give them the opportunity to take on responsibility and accountability, you're still, you are still, as the leader, you are responsible and accountable to their strategies and their actions. So always keep that in mind. If you look at the um, at the Hersey Blanchard, again, it's it's ultimately all about control. And you had the little, like I call it a right triangle. Uh, sloping down and and you had directive and consultative and and facilitative and delegative and then right in the middle you had that demarcation of control and over the directive and the consultative you had leader control and you had the follower control over the facilitative and delegative and as the leader goes closer to that demarcation of control line they're giving up more and more control to the followers but as you give up more and more control to followers, <clears throat> just always bear in mind that you are going to be responsible and you as a leader have to accept accountability for their strategies they develop, the actions that they um, that they exhibit as they go through the strategy process and working with team members and especially working with individuals within your company outside of your functional area. And the one thing I did like about uh, the Hersey Blanchard is I like that the levels one, two, three, and four, and it, it's, I talked about it in one of the other videos, you know, one is a lack of ability and confidence. Level two, it's somebody that's got the ability, but 
they just may not be as confident as, as you, you want to be. So directive works well on level one. Um, consultative works well on level two. You can have individuals that strong ability but lack confidence and maybe the facilitative works well on level three. And then level four is anybody that is just ready to take control and run with the project and, and do an excellent job. And that's when you turn around and delegate that, that work to them. Uh, and then last, probably the one that um, I'm not sure works would work as well for me as is the Vroom Jago because it's there's a decision tree and there's a lot of questions in that decision tree and they talk about you can skip questions and some questions are more important than others which I agree with some leaders might have a I don't want to say a difficult time may have somewhat of a difficult time determining which questions to to stay with and you know which ones to to skip as they go forward um because the decision tree if you if you get into it and look at it it's based on and built on significance again significance of the problem what your leader's expertise is i'm as i said earlier i'm not an it dude i'm, I'm not a programmer um, i know what i need programmed and i can tell somebody how I want the results to look, but I'm going to, if it's an IT type coding question, I'm going to offload it to somebody else with more expertise than I do. Uh, you've got your commitment of your followers. How committed are your followers in this decision tree? And then lastly, the followers ability within the thing. And then the last chapter, chapter six, we get into that, uh, um, ethics, moral, responsible leader, EML. Um, and they talk about as an EML leader, you know, you have to have confidence, you have to have, you know, concern with corporate image, you're concerned about the corporate brand. Uh, they they talk about procedural justice. I've never heard it called procedural justice, but I guess it makes sense because basically what they're talking about, you know, free of bias, you know, showing no favoritism, fairness consistency. If you're an EML leader, you want your policies and procedures and your goals and your vision to be consistent. You want everybody to be treated fairly. You don't want uh, there be any perception that you are unfair as you uh, make your decisions within your leadership of the company. And one of the things that I've always been concerned with about the EML process or ethics, you know, morality, uh, responsibility, accountability, a lot of it's perception. And while you may have um, everything in place and moving along like it should and, you know, getting, you know, checking all the boxes, all it takes is, a, you know, one or two individuals that have the perception that you aren't. And at that point, it's going to cause you issues. EML leaders, you know, they're tasked with setting policies, with making strategic decisions, you know, leading by example, you know, what they talk to you, you know, you, you, you know, you walk the talk, you, you know, the buck stops here. Um, all of those uh, little anecdotal phrases that you hear, but it's extremely important because you as a leader have to lead by example. And then they, they get into the, the pre-conventional, conventional and post-conventional. And I guess it, this has, I've never, again, I haven't, in an academic setting, um, run across this before, but it somewhat makes sense in the text because if you're pre-conventional, you're, you're more concerned about following the laws and rules. You don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to get punished. And as a leader, uh, you're, you're focused. You've got tunnel vision. You're focusing those rules. HR has rules. Um, legal has rules in the company. You're focused on following those. Um, if you're conventional, you, you, it, you know, you fall in line with groups. They, you know, in the text, they talk about fraternity sororities, you know, church groups, societal groups that you're a member of. And that's probably the most uh, frequent of these, these leadership styles in the EML setting. It's fallen in that conventional. And then the post-conventional, you know, it, it sets policies in, the, in accordance. You as a leader will set these policies in accordance with, um, your ethical and moral standards and your responsibility and accountability that you've developed over time. So um, 
probably takes a little more effort to get to uh, this post-conventional. And as they said in the text, these aren't stages that you graduate one to the next. You can be playing in you know, each of these types simultaneously. Or you as a leader may lean more to one type, but you know, you're know you know floating back and forth. So don't think of it as grade school, junior high, high school. Think of it as, as leadership styles and functions. And, and again, you may be playing in the sandbox all at the same time. And then get into um, servant leadership and traditional leadership. And, and I agree with the text. Most of the leadership styles in corporate America, it's more of a traditional. You've got the top managers, supervisors, middle managers, employees, customers, clients. You're, you're focused on earnings per share, focused on you know generating profits and information flows the same way. You know, flows, you know, leaders, top managers, middle managers, em em employees, and down to the clients. If you flip that triangle, invert that triangle, um, you think about, you know, servant leadership. And now all of a sudden your responsibility is toward others and you invert that triangle. And now you've got the clients and customers at the top. You've got the next step down employees, Next step, middle managers, and lastly, the top managers. So a, a little different, and, and the textbook actually makes a comment that unfortunately in corporate America, there's very few of the servant leadership. You will see that servant leadership sometimes in some, some mom-pop organizations, some smaller entities, you know, producing goods and services. Uh, you may actually see it in some for-profits, some charity work. So um, but in corporate America, for the most part, it's all going to, you know, be be generating that traditional um, type of, of, you know, I've heard people call it, you know, martini glass. So, you know, it's it's, you know, invert, you know, it's 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 the triangle, and you know, you, that you know, when you start to invert that triangle, it just, you know, it's just not enough for those uh, servant uh, leadership types in corporate America. Um, EMAL, when we talk about responsible and, and accountable, you're responsible to your followers, your owners, your shareholders, your customers, um, greater community. Uh, I saw that a lot with Blue Cross Blue Shield in Buffalo. You know, extremely active in the community, helping charities, helping um, public schools, just you know, bent over backwards, you know, building parks and, re and refurbishing other parks. And they're just, a uh, went a long way um, where, it, where it came to, to help in the community. And then we get into to what they call, you know, CSR, corporate responsibility. Um, and there's three types of orientations as leaders when it comes to CSR. You've got the traditional economist, um, somewhat defensive to CSR. They will implement CSR if it you know doesn't cost them anything because they are focused on earnings per share and keeping the shareholders happy. Then you've got the opportunity seekers. Um, you know they what they call virtual signaling. Um, they will implement CSR if the return on investments there, especially if they can uh, toot their own horn to the community or to the board of directors that you know, look what we did. They do a lot of, you know, cost benefit analysis before they implement it, because again, they want that return on investment, even if they can uh, help with their brand. And then you've got the integrator and that individual, that leader implements CSR and it doesn't seem to matter what the cost is because they are looking at society and the community as a whole when it comes to CSR. And I think that is... Pretty much going to wind it up um, for your review. I think um, it's a little, you know, a little more that the material is a little more challenging than the first three chapters in the text. But uh, if uh, you've got any questions about uh, chapters four, five, and six, don't hesitate to reach out to me and uh, I'll be more than happy to walk you through it. Next time we get together, we'll be. Uh, 
as a group going through and starting on chapter seven. Have a good evening. Thank you.